And joining us this morning live from Moscow is the president, a professor of international affairs at the New School and Nikita Khrushchev's great granddaughter, Nina Khrushcheva. Nina, it's great to have you. Thank you for the time. Now we Thank have this you. new audio message uh, from Prigozhin, basically suggesting it was more a protest about tactical military strategies. How, how much do we really know, even now? Well, we actually don't know that much. I mean, we know they keep issuing statements, and Prigozhin did change his tune. I mean, he was uh, on Saturday after Putin's address that it's mutiny, it's treason, and everybody will be punished. Prigozhin sort of got also angry and said, well, this is the corruption goes all the way up, and we need to cleanse it. But then very quickly, already on Saturday, changed his tune and said, well, that's actually not a mutiny, but it's just the march for justice. So we want more just system and better fighting conditions and whatnot. In some ways, he didn't quite change his tune, but it does seem that both sides decided that um, it's easier to part as non-mortal enemies because there is a war in Ukraine and this future is unclear and unknown. And we heard it from uh, people on Saturday, sort of the elites, the political figures on Saturday supporting Putin, the constitutional order saying that that's uh, this kind of disagreements uh, open um, uh, in open space only work for the enemy, as they kept kept saying. So it seems to me that for now they just decided that the fighting the war is more important than uh, the um, inside struggle. But, of course, we cannot separate the war from the inside struggle, since Prigozhin, until the war, was a military chief uh, or a PR chief or a propaganda chief, but he really was not uh, an important political figure. The war and his Wagner group that was fighting in Ukraine was more successful in fighting than the uh, official, uh, official troops of the Ministry of Defense. So that made him a political figure. So basically, it's a can of worms that Putin himself opened. There, there's one view uh, among market observers here in the U.S. that it was the closest you could have gotten over the weekend to a best-case scenario, meaning there was no bloodshed, uh, there was no serious turmoil, and yet Putin arguably was wounded. I wonder if you think that view is legitimate, uh, dangerous? No, I, I think it's very legitimate. I mean, it was the, the best it could have been resolved, I think. I mean, from what we know now. Uh, and I, it is interesting because I was, I'm in Moscow. I was walking around Moscow Saturday. Uh, so people had, depending on the time of the day, people had different sort of, they worried more, they worried less. But nobody really worried that much. And I know they were in other parts, even on the outskirts of Moscow and other cities where Prigozhin troops were marching, they were more military preparation. But in Moscow, the Red Square was closed, yes, but really the military wasn't that obvious in that scene. So it wasn't really a big surprise that it got resolved peacefully. Uh, Putin was wounded, not even so much from my point of view. Uh, I mean, you, of course, the, the fact that it all happened is already a great problem for Putin altogether. But it was resolved. So he could actually have had a PR coup for himself at night when it was all resolved instead of just Alexander Lukashenko, the Belarusian president, who allegedly uh, brokered the agreement and then statement that it's all resolved, Putin can, could have come out and said something about it, but he didn't. We haven't heard from him. He did speak to somebody. There was some statement put out talking to some young people, but nothing about, about the, uh, the, the mutiny, which was an important part of Russian life. Right. And I think the, the, the fact that we haven't heard from him is actually something that wounded him more than the, even the coup itself.